If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you at this time to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31, and Lord willing, we'll make it all the way through to the end of chapter 25. It's only taken us about two plus months to make it through chapters 24 and 25, but uh, there is hope that we'll actually make it through this entire book. It only took us two years, uh, although we may have the rapture before, who knows. So would you stand and join with me? I'm going to read the text out of the NIV, and you can follow along with me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Jesus is speaking, and Matthew is recording, and he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then, verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then, verse 37, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king, verse 40, will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let's pray and ask God to give us understanding. Lord, we need for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to show us that which you have for us today in your word. We need the distractions that might thwart us from what you have for us to be removed, that we might be able to focus our attention completely upon you. Lord, would you grant us this grace that we might leave this place knowing that we have communed with you and that you've communicated with us something for us that we take with us from this place into our day and into our week. Lord, will you do this for your name's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen, and may be seated. Well, this is part 10 of a study entitled The End of the World. And it's the end of this teaching of the end of the world, 10 weeks later. Uh, it all started when in Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked Jesus, What will be the signs of your return? What will be the signs of the end of the age or the end of the world? And so Jesus, in response to their question, lists for them many things that will be present on planet Earth right before the time known as the end. And even more specifically, certain things that would be present that would mean that the rapture, which comes before the tribulation, as we've just been studying the last couple of weeks, uh, those things that will 
cause us to look up and lift up our heads and know that our redemption draw nigh. One of the things that uh, I've been saying throughout this study, throughout this series, is that there is nothing prophetically that needs to happen before the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And that by God's design, every generation has thought it was going to be in their lifetime. Even the Apostle Paul, who writing to the Thessalonians said, we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet those who died in Christ first, who will be raised first, and will meet them in the air, and then will be with the Lord for all eternity. See, at the rapture, Jesus Christ comes for us. At the second coming, Jesus Christ comes with us. The rapture of the church and the second coming are separated by a period of time for seven years known as the Great Tribulation. Now, I'm going to make a statement that I need for you to really hear. And if you don't hear anything else that I share with you today out of Matthew 25, you really need to hear this. It is extremely important. Here it is. Though the rapture could happen at any time, and yes, we need to be ready because we do not know the day or the hour. We need to be ready for the rapture as if it could happen at an hour that we do not expect it this afternoon. We need to be as ready for the rapture if it were to take place this afternoon as we would be if it's not for another 10 or 20 years. Make plans, but hold on loosely to those plans. Have a loose touch and a light grip on this world and the things of this world. Listen, the rapture of the church may happen this afternoon. Are you ready? The rapture of the church may not happen for another 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Will you be as ready then if it's not until then? Here's why. We are told in the scriptures to occupy till he comes. We are also told to redeem the time because the days are evil. And by the way, as I read the pages of Holy Writ, it's going to wax worse and worse and even is. And that is even another prophetic sign that in the last days, people will be lovers of selves and lovers of money and lovers of pleasure and not lovers of God. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. All you got to do is read the headlines and you see that we live in an evil, evil world. And it is as it was in the days of Noah, as we studied in Matthew 24. Now, I think it's important to state this. I don't know that you can overstate it, so forgive me if I attempt to maybe do that. Because, see, Christians have really given a black eye to Bible prophecy, if I can say it that way. Uh, many Bible teachers have been guilty of even so much as date setting or leaving Christians with the impression that, man, What's the use? Why am I furthering my education? Why am I building this business? Why am I pursuing this plan? Why am I doing this or why am I doing that? Man, if Jesus is coming, I'm just going to run up my, my credit cards. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> I might as well just go away on the mountain for him to come. Listen. That's the, the worst thing that you could do. I think that I would be grossly remiss if I did not leave you and myself included with this urgency, this now, this sense that God can send the trumpet call and the Lord could come at any time. But we need to live each day like it could be our last day. Pursue those plans if that is what God has called you to do. And live each day like it could be your last day. And whatever your hands find to do, do with all your might. You've got nothing to lose. Here's what I'm thinking. 
For those who figure, hey, you know, what's the use? I'll drop out of school. I'll drop out of life. I'll just wait for the Lord to return. I believe the Lord could come at any time. There's really no point. There's really no purpose in really doing anything. I'm just going to wait for the Lord to come. Then when the Lord doesn't come, it has really stumbled a lot of people. It has really messed up a lot of people's lives. And I hope that in the last couple of months, as we've, you know, gone through this series, that I've not communicated to you that one dynamic. That is, again, the worst thing that we could do. I think, if anything, what we need to be doing is we need to be living our lives with this sense of urgency. Because really, the purpose of our lives is simply two things. Number one, to know Jesus in a saving way. And number two, to share Jesus with others so they know him in a saving way. Number one, to know Jesus. And number two, to let others know about Jesus. Here's one more thing, and then we'll, we'll get started here. Um, and I apologize for the long introduction, but again, I think it needs to be said. Uh, aren't you glad the Lord didn't come back before you got saved? You know, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, the way Peter says, you know. It does seem like the Lord delays his coming. I got saved in the year 1982. I thank God that he did not come in 1981. I am just very conscious. Now, again, some of you are wondering, well, what happens after the rapture? Will people have a chance to give their lives to Jesus Christ during the tribulation? Yes and no. Let me explain it's going to be extremely difficult to uh, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ after the rapture. Why? Two things. Number one, the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth. The Holy Spirit is still present, but not in the in or the epi. In other words, not in the believers because the believers have been removed. Not in the epi, in the original language where the Holy Spirit is poured out, but he will still be power alongside. He will still come alongside people, but here's the problem and the second reason why it is extremely difficult. See, God says that he's going to send the world a strong delusion, and they will be deceived. It's been said that when you reject the truth, you, you are susceptible to the most bizarre of lies. This is why some Bible teachers believe that at the rapture, people who are left behind will be told that it was alien abduction. Have you noticed the increased interest in alien abductions? Mercy. I mean, I, I look at some of these TV uh, you know, programs that are coming up vanished without a trace. Uh, you know, I think that this movie, uh, years and years ago, Invasion of the Body Signatures, remember that movie? Good, that means you're close to my age. I love you, man. <laughs> you know, people are going, huh? Yeah, like a dog, when it doesn't, you know, quite understand. Um, no, I did not just call you a dog. I'm just saying that. <laughs> You're too young to understand. But there was this movie years and years ago, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where aliens would come and possess these, you know, people and, and invade them and possess them and, and snatch away their bodies. See, I believe this is a desensitizing of people, and it is part and parcel to the deception that people will believe because they've rejected the truth, and Jesus Christ is the truth. See, and those who enter the tribulation are going to have a very difficult time surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ. And it's been said that if you're not going to live for the Lord before the rapture, what makes you think you'd be willing to die for the Lord after the rapture and in the tribulation? Because that's what it's going to require. It, you're going to have to live outside the economic system of the Antichrist because you will not be able to buy or sell. We'll be talking about this a little bit today. Guess what this parable deals with? It deals with those who made it through the seven-year tribulation. So it's going to require that you uh, reject the Antichrist, and there will be those who will not accept Jesus Christ in the tribulation, but they will not accept the mark of the Antichrist either. And they will actually survive outside of the one world order, the one world religion, the one world economic system, and the one world government. 
and they will make it through the tribulation miraculously, and they will be uh, allowed access and enter into the millennium, which is a 1,000 year rule and reign here on planet Earth in its pre fall state. And those who make it through the tribulation and enter into the millennium will have the bodies that Adam and Eve have. And that's why they'll be able to live for 1,000 years. And during this 1,000 year period, Satan is bound. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll, we'll talk more about this. I know this is kind of gnarly to some of you. Uh, and it really is weird because when you think about the earth in its free fallen state, and, and we're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ with an enforced righteousness of source during this 1,000 year reign, during this millennium uh, period. You know, we think a lot about heaven, about the rapture, you know, about being in heaven, but there's going to be a 1,000 year period before heaven, before the new heaven and the new earth, where we're going to be on earth with Christ in our glorified bodies. But did you know that there will be people that will have children and their children will have children and their children's children will be, have children? And at the end of the millennium, Satan will be loosed and then those people will choose between Jesus Christ and Satan. And it's, it's astonishing that some actually, after living in a place of perfection, where Satan is bound and he cannot tempt people, that at the end of that thousand years, they will actually believe the deception when Satan is finally loose and choose to reject Jesus Christ and choose the devil. And that's the final judgment. And that's the final battle. And that's when then they are sent to hell. It's been said that God never sends anybody to hell. In fact, Jesus said, if anybody goes to hell, it's over my dead body, literally. I died so that nobody would go to hell. Hell was never prepared for man. Hell was prepared for the demons, for the devil. So people send themselves to hell when they reject Jesus Christ and believe the lie of Satan. And then after this millennium, then it's the new heaven, then it's the new earth, and that is eternity future forever and ever and ever and ever. That's our glory and soul. That's our blessed assurance. Well, let's look at this um, parable more closely now. So, lastly, please, be as ready for the rapture as if it could happen today as you would be if it's not for another 10 or 15 years. I know I still have long-range plans. I still have plans for the future. I, I hold on to them like this, not like this. But like this, just Lord, not my will, but your will be done. It's been said that man proposes, but God disposes. So I've given God editing rights over those future plans. Should he wish to, you know, interrupt them, in which he has my complete cooperation, if he wants to interrupt my future plans with the rapture, that's very kosher with me. I just want you to know, I'm ready. I'm as ready if it's today as I would be if it's not another 10 years from now. I was thinking about it this way. My uh, oldest son is eight. And if it's not 10 years, that means he'll be 18. <laughs> Lord Jesus, come quickly. Because see, at 16, he can drive. So I'm just saying, Lord, I, know. <laughs> I just, please, I don't want to set dates, but this would be a good date. This would be a good time before he is, <laughs> so some of you feel my pain. So, verse 31, Jesus declares that his second coming, which again is at the end of the seven-year tribulation, that he will come in all his glory with all his angels and will sit on his throne. In verses 32 through 33, all the nations that are gathered before him, he'll separate them. Now, these are different nationalities. He's not separating them by nations. He's just gathering all the different nationalities, and he's separating them not by nationality, but he's separating them, the sheep on his right, as a shepherd does, and the goats on his left. In verse 34, he blesses the sheep on the right, and he says, here's your inheritance. What is your inheritance? The kingdom age. What is the kingdom age? The kingdom age is the millennium. 
That's the kingdom age, the kingdom reign, the 1,000 year period where we rule and reign with him. And it was prepared since the beginning of creation, verse 34 tells us. Verse 35, he blesses them and he tells them why. It's because you gave me something to eat when I was hungry. It's because you gave me something to drink when I was thirsty. It's because you invited me in when I was a stranger. And then in verse 36, he says, it's because you clothed me when I needed clothing. And you looked after me when I was sick. And you, when I was in prison, took the time to come and visit me, verse 36. And in verse 37, they're astonished. They answer him and say, when did we do this? When were you hungry? And when did we feed you when you were hungry? And when did we give you drink when you were thirsty? And then in verse 38, they even wonder when it was that he was a stranger and when it was that they invited him in. And when did we give you clothes when you needed clothing? And when, verse 39, did we look after you and tend to you when you were sick? And when was it that we visited you in prison? And in verse 40, Jesus says, basically, the truth of the matter is, when you did it for the least of these brethren of mine, put that in your hip pocket, we'll come right back to it, it was as if you were doing it unto me. When you did it to the least of these, my brethren, my brothers, my sisters, my people, it was as if you did it for me. And that's when you did it. For me. Now here's the contrast, verses 41 through 43. He curses to hell those who did not give him food or drink or invite him in or clothe him or tend to him when he was sick or visit him when he was in prison. And then in verses 44 through and 45, they ask the same question on the opposite side of the table. When was it that we didn't respond to you? When you were in need? When was it that we did not give you clothes to wear or tend to you when you were sick or food to eat or drink when you were thirsty or visit you when you were in prison? And he says to them, basically on the again opposite side of the table, it's when you did not do it for the least of these brethren of mine. And some of your translations will use the word brethren. Uh, the NIV says the least of these, but he is talking about the brethren, his people. And then in verse 46, he says that because of this, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous will not only in inherit the kingdom age, but they will go on into eternity future, the new heaven and the new earth for eternal life. Now, let's look at the meaning of this parable. It is profound. It is huge. It is enormous. It is a profound teaching. Please, I don't want you to miss it. Well, the King of Glory, or the Son of Man, is obviously Jesus Christ. The sheep, those who took care of the Jews and entered the Kingdom Age because of it, or the Millennium. Synonymous is the Kingdom Age with the Millennium. Who are the goats? The goats are those who did not take care for the Jews, and they, as a result, consequently, do not enter the kingdom age. Who are the brethren, or the least of these? I believe, and there, Bible teachers kind of, some say it's just the Jews who get saved in the tribulation. Because again, what is the purpose of the tribulation? It's for the salvation of the Jewish nation. I believe that it makes up a constituency of not just Jews, but I believe possibly Gentiles as well. Because you see, Jesus, when asked, he was told, your mom and your brothers, and by the way, Joseph and Mary did have other children. Uh, James, the New Testament epistle of James, that's Jesus' half-brother. <laughs> I just want you to know that. Could you imagine that uh, growing up as the, the Savior's brother. <laughs> you mentioned Joseph and Mary. James, 
How come you don't keep your room as clean as Jesus? <laughs> come on, what? <laughs> Always comparing your I don't think I did that. <laughs> Poor guy. That's why when you read the epistle of James, you kind of walk away from it with the impression that what you see is what you get. He has immense words. <laughs> you can't blame him, you know, being uh, Jesus' half-brother. But when Jesus was approached, and he said, hey, Jesus, your, your mom's here, your, your, your brother and, you know, brothers and sisters are here. Uh, he said, no, who are my brothers and sisters? They are those who obey me, who follow me. They are the ones who are believers in me. So that is who are his brethren. So I believe that it is those made up of both Jews and Gentiles as well who are saved during the tribulation. And that's who he's talking about. Now, I love Warren Wiersbe's commentary on this. He says, since they, the least of these brethren, would be enemies of the Antichrist, because again, this is during the tribulation now. This parable at the end of Matthew 25 is describing for us and illustrating for us what it's going to be like at the end of the tribulation. These least of these who get saved during the tribulation, as difficult as it is, will be enemies of the Antichrist, and they would suffer great persecution. They would not be able to buy or sell because they have not accepted the mark of the Antichrist, and thus they would be hungry. They would flee from their homes and would need a place to stay. That's why Jesus said, when you took me in as a stranger, uh, they would be without jobs. They would, because of, they would be without the mark of the beast, they would not be able to secure clothing, and many would be cast into prison. So there will be those who, like during the Holocaust, protected God's chosen people, and will show love to them by hiding them, tending to them, feeding them, clothing them, and visiting them in prison. Now, it's important to know that these acts of kindness are not good works that save them. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, you're familiar with it. You're not, you, you, we are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. This is not the litmus test that grants them access into the kingdom age, because again, at the end of the millennium or the kingdom age, that's when they're going to make their decision between Jesus Christ and the devil. There were many uh, people who were not necessarily believers in Jesus Christ that tended to and took care of the Jews during the Holocaust. <coughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that they were believers. Now, I believe that the believers are going to be the ones who will need to be taken care of during the seven-year tribulation. And this will be a proof of their faith in the message and their love for Christ. Because it's, it's you can't love God and not love God's people. That's why the first five commandments are all about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second five are about loving your neighbor. The, the first five are vertical. And the second five commandments are horizontal in the shape of a cross. That's not coincidence, by the way. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture of a cross. Even when the Israelites were commanded to take a spotless lamb, inspect it for four days, the way Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was inspected for four days. If found without spot or wrinkle, he was to be slain, and the blood was to be placed so that the angel of death would pass over them on their door, top, bottom, side, side, in the shape of a cross. When the priest would present their offering at the altar, they would do the wave offering. I know I've said this before, but I never tire of saying this because I think that the, the scriptures are very fascinating in the Old Testament. And I'm even now praying about, uh, you know, starting in the Old Testament when we finish with Matthew. It is so rich, the Old Testament, because the wave offering was up and down, and left to right in the shape of a cross. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to the person of Jesus Christ, both his first coming and subsequently his second coming. See? 
So this is uh, interesting to me that if you're in alignment with God, first five commandments vertical, then you'll be in alignment with your neighbor, second five commandments horizontal. You know, I don't mean to make light of marriage problems or, you know, problems that Christians face in their life, but I submit to you at the risk of maybe offering and presenting an oversimplification that a lot of times our problem is not with our spouse or with our employees or an employer or our neighbor or our whoever, you fill in the blank. Our problem is with the Lord. We got, we're out of alignment with the Lord. If I'm out of fellowship with God, I'm going to be out of fellowship with you. If I'm in fellowship with you and I love, it's because I'm in fellowship with God. If I love God, I'm going to love you. And that is the, the, the greatest commandment that fulfills the law. If I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and strength, it is the catalyst for me to love you as I already love myself. And make no mistake about it, I love me. I love you very much. This thing about you need to love yourself. <laughs> Give me a break. You gotta be kidding me. You you love you. I know you do. You think about you all the time. <laughs> when you walk by a window, don't you look at you to see how you look? True, when you get photographs back from the, you know, uh, developing, do you look for, you look for the, if you're in that picture, who are you looking at? You! You're looking at you! I was reading in my devotions and Oswald Chambers um, uh, <laughs> writing, and uh, he said that discouragement is disenchantment of self-love. Think about that. Discouragement is disenchantment of self-love. You know, to, to get down on yourself and discouraged and, and defeated, and it's, it's because your eyes are on yourself. Listen, we already love ourselves. And what Jesus is saying is, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then it will be the catalyst for you to fulfill the second five commandments, and that is to love others as you already love yourself. Show me a Christian who is loving. It's the fruit of the Spirit, singular. It's not fruits. Galatians says it is the fruit of the Spirit, love. From love comes joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, kindness, patience. <laughs> Let's not talk too much about that one. And self-control. That is the sweetness that comes from the ripe fruit, singular, of love. See? So during the tribulation, there will be those, because of their love for God, that will love God's people, who are the believers, who are the least of these, who are his brethren. I love what Chuck Smith says regarding this passage. He says, there will be those who survive and will be alive on the earth when Jesus comes again in clouds and great glory with his saints to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. But the fact that you survive the great tribulation does not guarantee or ensure you that you'll be allowed to live on into the kingdom age. When the Lord returns with his church, then shall he gather together the nations to judge, and he will separate them at that time, those which will be allowed to enter into the kingdom and those that are cut off. So those who survive the great tribulation will live on into the kingdom age, or the millennium, when our Lord returns with his church in glory. Again, the rapture, he comes for the church. The second coming, he comes with the church in glory. So he's talking now about the judgment of nations that will take place when he returns at the second coming, at the end of the tribulation. Now, for those of you, bless your hearts, that have been uh, with us throughout the entirety of this 10-week series on the end of the world, I'm sure have uh, maybe some questions. Maybe it's still an enigma. How, how does everything fit together? 
Uh, I've talked with some of you, uh, both before and after the services, and uh, your questions are great questions. I love when you email me questions, by the way. I try to get back to you as soon as I can with, you know, uh, the answer. Sometimes I don't really have the answer on tap. I need to search it out and make sure that I'm giving you the right answer from the Word. But what I hope to do today in the conclusion of this End of the World series is kind of give you a, a template for the events that will come at the end. So where's the tribulation? Where's the rapture? Where's the second coming? Where's the millennium? Where's the white, great white throne judgment? Where's the being the seat of Christ? Where's the first resurrection? Where's the second death? <laughs> I already have you <laughs> wondering, okay, great. How are you going to do this? Well, I tend to look at things the way I'm wired, and I don't presume to think that you're wired the same way. In fact, <laughs> if you are, we need to pray for you, you poor soul. But I tend to look at things so visually, and I, and I need to organize them kind of in this table format so I can kind of separate it in my own mind. And so in the remaining time that we have together, I want to give you what I believe from the scriptures is the uh, end time events as they happen and when they happen and at what place it is that they happen. So what I've done, I've kind of divided it into four different sections. First, the event. Second, the timing. And then the explanation of what it is with the scriptures. And then the duration of how long it is. Now, Again, the next thing on God's calendar, prophetically, is the rapture. There's nothing that has to happen before the rapture. That's why it can, we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. We're not looking for the temple to be rebuilt. That happens after the rapture, and then the Antichrist can be revealed. The scriptures declare that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is raptured. Then he can be revealed. And then he fulfills Daniel 9 27 and presents his peace plan, which I submit to you is already on the table. Because I believe very much so, and emphatically so, that the Antichrist is alive and well and already behind the scenes orchestrating the events that the Bible foretells will take place before the end. So the rapture is next, and it happens again before the tribulation. And there are two passages of Scripture that directly talk about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. It's where born-again Christians, born again of the Spirit of God, Sealed by the Spirit of God for redemption. They are the ones who are waiting and watching, and they will be taken up to meet Jesus Christ. He'll take us to his Father's house as his bride, where there's plenty of room, <laughs> plenty of parking. I don't want to be parking. But and it happens in the twinkling of an eye, not the blink of an eye, the twinkling of an eye, almost not measurable from a time standpoint. It's that sparkle. Try to measure a sparkle. It is not really a calculable, it, it, am I saying that word right? <laughs> Let's just say that I am. Uh, so, but it is incalculable, the amount of time it happens in the twinkling of an eye. Now, what, what happens to our bodies? Well, listen, I don't know about you, when I look at this carcass in the mirror, <laughs> I thank God that we're getting new bodies. It's been, <laughs> in the original language, it's the word metamorphosis. It's a, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, we pull off the corruptible, because outwardly we're decaying day by day, inwardly renewed day by day. So we get rid of this old, decaying body. Lord, come quickly. I've got some miles on this body. And then we get our glorified bodies. When we see Him, we will be like Him. We will be glorified. We'll be given our eternal bodies. So this all happens in the twinkling of an eye. I don't know about you, but that is... 
That's what makes my day. I mean, that just, that is, that is it, isn't it? Isn't that it? Isn't that a thing that every day that goes by is one more day closer to the rational? Then it's not going to matter anymore. It's just not going to matter anymore. After the rapture starts, and really at the rapture, the first resurrection. Now what is this? This is a bodily resurrection where the Apostle Paul to the Church of Thessalonica says the dead in Christ will rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? Those believers in Jesus Christ whose bodies have either been cremated and put in the ocean, the sea will give up their dead, Revelation says. Uh, they're the graves where the, the remains, the earthly bodies are. Now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The best way I've ever heard it described, when you die, your body is like a light bulb. The electricity is like the spirit. And the light that is created when you bring electricity and bulb together is like the soul. We are created in the image of God, triune in nature, body, soul, and spirit. Now, when a light bulb ceases, it's like when we are deceased. We take the light bulb out of the socket, we throw it in the rubbish can, and it goes to the dump, it goes back into the ground, dust to dust from where it was created. It's material, it's the body, it's like our body goes into the ground. The electricity goes back to its source, like our spirit, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So if my spirit, born again of the Spirit of God, redeemed, and, and the Holy Spirit in me, I go to be with the Lord. If I'm not born again of the Spirit of God, then my spirit goes to hell. Actually, get him until Hades and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So, like the spirit, like electricity is the spirit, it goes back to the source. The Holy Spirit, heaven, and evil spirit, hell. It's one or the other, there's no one between. There's no limbo, there's no uh, purgatory, there's no uh, whatever they call it, there's no such thing. There's no place at all like that. Now, the soul, like the light, we were created for eternity. The soul is eternal. When our spirit is reunited with our glorified body, we create a living soul for all eternity. And that's the light for all eternity, you see. So, two is why we read of those who go to hell, they will be in outer darkness. Forever. Hell is forever. It is a real place. Just as heaven is a real place. If hell is not forever, then hell, uh, if hell is not forever, then heaven cannot be forever. So this first resurrection starts at the rapture, and from what I can see in the scriptures, it, it lasts for seven years. A bodily resurrection of those who died in Christ, are taken up to meet together with us who are alive at the rapture. This is the first resurrection. Now, after that comes the seven-year tribulation. This is where the Antichrist confirms the existing covenant, uh, but it's an uncertain covenant or peace agreement with the Middle East. It's Daniel 9, 27. He shall confirm a covenant for seven years. Uh, then he commits the abomination of desolation. This is Matthew 24, 15, where he demands to be worshipped. The abomination is he takes an unclean sacrifice and sprinkles the blood of it all over and desecrates the rebuilt temple, which will be rebuilt in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Some believe without disturbing the Mosque of Oman or the Dome of the Rock. Now, God's wrath is poured out on earth, and it leads to the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon takes place at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Now, we talked about Ezekiel 38, the Battle of God. What's the difference between the Battle of God and the Battle of Armageddon? Now, I've talked with Chuck Missler about this, and I've talked with Dave Hunt about this. In fact, one, one day I, I went to lunch with Dave Hunt and Chuck Missler, at the same time. I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> I was just sitting there just going, 
<laughs> my hair hurt afterwards. I just thought, oh, God, these guys just, I mean, it's amazing. But anyway, uh, Dave Hunt does not believe that the battle of God happens before or at or shortly after the rapture or the beginning of the tribulation. He thinks that the battle of God and the battle of Armageddon will sort of dovetail one into the other. I, you know, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I do believe that, and I'll tell you, it's because of a, of a, a passage in chapter 39 of Ezekiel where it describes Israel having to take great care and caution in dealing with the nuclear fallout of the weaponry, uh, sort of describing a nuclear exchange, which Zechariah also the prophet describes, and it sort of ties together, that, that they use it for fuel for a period of seven years. And I think that it, that's why I believe that it's possible that the battle of God or the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 can happen at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. One uh, Bible scholar has likened the battle of God and the battle of Armageddon as bookends on the tribulation. So you have Ezekiel 38, the battle of God, uh, you know, on the front of the tribulation, and then you have the battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation, and that's what ushers in the uh, second coming. Well, Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, d describes the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Yezreel, or Jezreel, as it's pronounced. It's in Israel. Some of you who have had the privilege of going to Israel have seen this place. Uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said if there's ever to be a final battle to be fought, it ought to be here. <laughs> it's as far as the eye can see, and it's where the blood will be splattered up to the horse's bridle. It will be really that last world war, if you will, that will take place on planet Earth. Now, uh, this uh, the tribulation, of course, lasts for seven years. Now comes the second coming at the conclusion of the seven-year tribulation, the end, after the tribulation. This is where the Lord returns to the earth with us, his bride. This is where every eye will see him. This is why the rapture is a catching away, an abduction, if you will. Uh, it, it comes uh, as a thief in the night. Not every eye is going to see the, the rapture. The second coming, every eye will see him, and every knee will bow to him, and every tongue will confess about him that he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You know, I cannot wait for that day. I cannot wait for that day. Without mentioning names, there are people who are the most blasphemous and the most anti-Christian people on the face of the earth alive today. And you know what? Only what gets me through watching them blaspheme my Jesus and your Jesus is knowing that one day they will go to their knees and they will confess that he's Lord of Lords and that he's King of Kings. And that's the only thing that keeps me from throwing my television out the window and burning it in my front lawn. That's the only thing. Why? Because one day they will confess. Every single one of them will confess. I feel better. I just had to get that off my chest. Uh, this is Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. This is the parable that we're studying today. This is at the end where the great separation of every nationality, of every tribe, of every tongue, of every people. And there's no duration mentioned for this. We just know that it will happen. We don't know how long. Then comes the millennium. This is where then those will be uh, ushered into that millennium. It comes after the second coming. And this is where Revelation 20 verses 1 through 4 tell us that the devil is cast into the bottomless pit. And those who don't take the mark are beheaded. Very Islamic, by the way. That's why I believe Islam will be and have a role in the one world religion. And that's the goal of Islam. The goal of Islam is that every nation and every people convert, even by force, by submission to Allah, to Islam. This is the goal. The goal of Islam is to fly the, the, the Islamic flag in the White House. Uh, those who don't take the mark are beheaded and will reign with Christ 
The rest remain dead until the end of the millennium and don't take part in the first resurrection. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. By the way, uh, I know you've heard me say it. I need to say it real quickly that Revelation chapter 1, verse 19 has a unique feature that no other book of all the 66 books of the Bible has. It has a divine outline where John on the island of Patmos is told to write that which he has seen, that which is, and that which will happen after these things. In other words, John, write that which is past, which you were the eyewitness of, that which is present, and that which is yet to come future. Past, present, future. And so you have this divine outline where the whole book of Revelation has past, present, and future. And it's in a chronological order. There are some parenthetical insertions, especially in chapter 6 through 19. But for the most part, chapter 1 is all about Jesus Christ, past, crucified, resurrected, and glorified. Chapters 2 and 3 is seven letters to the church, representative of the church age presently that we're living in now, today. And then chapter 4, verse 1, the rapture, and everything from chapter 4, verse 1 on is future. Chapters 4 and 5, the rapture. Chapter 6 through 19, the seven-year tribulation. Chapter 20, the millennium. Chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. There's one other component in the book of Revelation unique to this book that no other book has. It promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. It says in chapter 1, I think it's about verse 3. This is why I believe that Satan has succeeded in keeping Christians out of the book of Revelation and keeping pastors from teaching the book of Revelation. I think it's, it's, it's a, a sad commentary, for lack of a better word, off the top of my head, to, to say the least, that Christians and pastors alike can shame on them, that they don't teach the book of Revelation. They are robbing themselves and the people whom God has brought into their care one of the most magnificent blessings. You know, I started a study of Bible prophecy in the year 1995. It was after my mom died. Uh, my dad had died nine months prior. And it changed my life. And I believe that it's because of that, for the most part, that I'm in the ministry today. It has such a profound impact on my life that I just wanted to devote all the rest of the days of my life teaching the Word of God and Bible prophecy, which you can't teach the Bible without teaching Bible prophecy because two-thirds of the Bible is prophecy. I don't know how you can, you can teach about the Bible, but you cannot teach the Bible and not teach Bible prophecy. And I'll tell you, I think that, um, in fact, the birth of this church, Calvary Chapel County, when it came uh, as a result of a Friday night Bible study through the book of Revelation, I think that that was about the fifth time that I've taught through the book of Revelation. And every time I teach through it, I get more blessed. And there's this divine, chron chronologically ordered, sequence of events laid out for us in the book of Revelation that tells us what our future holds, and more importantly, who holds our future. That's why there's no fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. That's why I don't freak out about what Mahmoud Ahmadinejad says that he's going to do. I don't freak out when I see on the internet video of military formations in the shape of a missile blowing apart a formation of the words U.S. and the Star of David. Because remember, Christian living in the United States of America, you're the great Satan, and Israel's the little Satan. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> Listen, Islam, the, the Islam religion wants, hates you, hates you, and wants to destroy this country because this, even though we're in a post-Christian nation, we are still Christians in this nation, and we support Israel, and that's why. They hate God, and they hate God's people, and that's why. 
Islam is not peace loving. I received an email from a Bible scholar uh, in the Calvary Chapel movement, and he's warning Calvary Chapel pastors worldwide. You need to speak the truth. The greatest threat to us in the church today is Islam. Islam. Make no mistake about it. And please don't make synonymous Arabs with Muslims, like Americans with Christians. That's a mistake. Indonesia is the, the most populated nation of Muslims. Iran, they're not Arabs, they're Persians. And they're a Muslim country. Just because you're an Arab does not mean you're a Muslim. Otherwise, your pastor is... <laughs> never mind. But, <laughs> it, it, but just like being an American does not make you a Christian. Well, let's move on and bring it in for the land here. So... The final battle comes after the millennium, and the devil is loosed, and he deceives a multitude and gathers them to battle. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. The devil is cast into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever. This is in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. Again, no duration mentioned. When does this happen? This is the final, final battle. It's after the millennium. When Satan is loosed, and those alive and born during the, the, the millennium will have to choose. That's the final uh, judgment that comes after the final battle. Those that choose Satan, believe it or not, they will. They go to the great white throne judgment. We don't go to the great white throne judgment. We go to the bema seat of Christ. The bema seat of Christ is different. We're given rewards. First Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says that those things done in the flesh will be like wood, hay, and stubble. They'll burn. Those things done in the spirit, those treasures laid up in heaven, that same fire that burns the works and the deeds of the flesh. And by the way, we're going to have a pretty large pile. <laughs> Might take a while. But those things done for the Lord and for the kingdom, that same fire that will destroy the wood, hay, and stubble will also purify and make more valuable the, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. Those are the jewels, the rewards that we will receive at the bema seat of Christ. So that's our judgment, but those who reject Christ go to the great white throne judgment, but every man is judged. The book of life is open, and we are rewarded for those things which are written in it according to our works. But again, we are not as believers a part of the great white throne judgment. That's Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Uh, some Bible scholars believe that we go to the beam of seat of Christ, receive our rewards at the rapture. Right then. But this great white throne judgment isn't until after the millennium, when everybody has had a chance to make their decision. Again, no motivation mentioned. The second death comes after the final judgment. It's been said, if you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. Death no more has a sting. If you're born once, physically, and but not born again the second time spiritually, uh, then you, you die twice. You die first physically, and then you die spiritually for all eternity. This is where death and hell are cast into the lake of fire along with anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, Revelation 20, verse 14. Again, all eternity. Lastly, the new heaven and the new earth, and it's after the second death. The new Jerusalem comes down from God of heaven. God himself will be with us. It will wipe away all tears from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Revelation 21, verse 1, for all eternity. Church, I uh, have really deemed it a privilege to have uh, been able for these last 10 weeks to teach you out of Matthew 24 and 25. And did you like how I snuck Revelation in there? <laughs> kind of wove it in through the fabric of our series. Uh, I, I can't help myself. I just love that book. As ap apocalyptic as it is. But again, apocalyptic means revealing in the original Greek. But I just, I want to, uh, it's, it's almost a, a bittersweet you know, thing. We come to the end of a study that for me personally has been huge. Uh, I'll tell you why, if I could just really be candid with you in closing. Um, you know, it's helped me to uh, focus my attention 
on the Lord and his soon return, especially in light of recent events in the Middle East. And by the way, this ceasefire is really shaky. I just really believe that it's, uh, it's just not that at all. Um, and they're even talking about a greater war coming as a result of the heels of it. But suffice it to say that uh, for me, it's done what Isaiah says is that happy is he whose mind is stayed on me. Uh, this has uh, focused the attention of my thoughts and my heart on him. And it's brought a, a, a joy and a happiness, a peace and a calmness. I tell you, it's, it's uh, helped me through. Uh, these, you know, last uh, few months now, uh, since we've lost our, our baby girl, our daughter, Rulel, in May of this year. And uh, I tell you, it has really encouraged me, as the Apostle Paul said, when the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And my mom, too, who died in 1995. I hold my dad, who died in 1994. But I'm going to see them again. And I'm going to meet them again in the air. And what it's done, this, this study of Bible prophecy as it relates to the events leading up to the end of the world, is that it has focused my attention and loosened my grip off of this world so as to grab hold of the next. And in so doing, it has caused me to fix my eyes on him, to have my mind stayed on him, and to long for that day when he himself, personally, will wipe the tears from my eyes. The psalmist says that what we sow in tears, we reap in joy. Every tear is king. Every tear that falls from our eyes is count. And weeping lasts for the night, the psalm says, but joy returns in the morning. And he is, Revelation says, on the morning star. The bad news is judgment is coming. And I know that many of us have many loved ones who do not know Jesus Christ. Galatians 6 9 is a word for you to encourage you. Do not be weary in well doing, for in due season you shall weep if you faint not. God is using you in their lives. And how do you know that salvation may not come for such a time as this? Don't grow weary. Keep praying. And keep hoping and keep trusting the Lord for their salvation. But I submit to you, uh, it's with uh, a little bit of grief that I, I leave this study, as we'll start in Matthew chapter 26 next week, Lord uh, But I tell you, there's, there's just a, a power in Bible prophecy. It has the power to really put things into perspective. It has a purifying effect. It has a profound effect on how we live our lives. And I really just want to encourage you this week, especially if you're able to get to the Bible prophecy teachings at Calvary Chapel, come online. I really encourage you to do so. Uh, it is, and it can, and it, and it should, really, just have such a life-changing impact on you. And I pray that for you, having experienced that myself. So I, I pray, too, that this study of Bible prophecy isn't just something that we put on the shelf and go back to business as usual, but that God, by His Spirit, will prompt you and quicken your heart to seek and search these things out. And don't take my word for this. Be a Berean and search the Scriptures and see if this be so. Because if it is, the ramifications are huge. The ramifications are huge. If you, if you don't really know for sure that you're born again in the Spirit of God. That you have the Holy Spirit in you and dwelling you and sealing you for that, that great and final day. I really encourage you when we close in prayer to make that decision today. And maybe for you it's a recommitment of your life to the Lord. Because I believe He's coming very soon. Very soon. Nay, even before my eight-year-old asks for the car keys. <laughs> <laughs>